Let's, let's just pray. So nice to see all of you. Uh, I, I assume and I hope that I'm assuming correctly that you don't mind sitting here because it's... Uh, <laughs> it suits me. <laughs> I would suit you. And if you're sitting somewhere, then you should be grateful. <laughs> well, the, they tell us, uh, read, read the word. Yeah. They stand up in the synagogue to read the word and they sit down to teach. That's so, yeah. You may stand. <laughs> <laughs> you can go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just pray. Yeah? Father, we, we love you. We intensely love you. We thank you so much that you've placed your love and you, you, you poured out your love, the abundance of who you are, into our lives. Not a trickle, not a little stream, but an avalanche, which it doesn't even describe it well, of your love poured into us. Your love, Lord. And we thank you. And thank you we can take that love and love you back. Because without that we cannot do it. In and of ourselves, as human beings, we don't have that kind of love, but you've poured it into our lives, and we're grateful. We would love you with it, and we'd love each other with that, and love ourselves with that. And thank you for that. Thank you for your word that's alive and powerful and sharper than any two that sword. As we read your word and look at it, I thank you that you, that you help us in our helplessness at times, in our awkwardness. As we look at your word, and your word will blossom inside of us and grow. And that we ask that your word will become flesh again through us, Lord. That we won't just hear it, but we'll consume it. <laughs> and that we'll, that will give us life. Amen. Um, we're dealing with John 14, 15, 16 and 17. We're looking at the Holy Spirit. Now, not in every chapter of those four chapters that I'm speaking to you about, probably mostly in, in John um, 14, is the Holy Spirit mentioned. But everything else that flows out of that, of what he says, I'm sending the, I'm sending the counselor to you, I'm sending someone just like me, I'm sending the advocate to you, the helper, one that comes alongside, all of that. And then he kind of sums it up, if you like, in towards the end of John 14. Uh, I'll just read it to you quickly. You have heard me say, uh, from verse 28. Well, we could, <laughs> could probably read the whole thing. Verse 26, But the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with, you, leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And I've said, Jesus probably has, he doesn't say that yet, but I've said something, some things to you. And let me just say this to you. Uh, Joshua gets that, uh, those of you there on Sunday morning, in Joshua chapter 1, <laughs> God says to you, you gotta, you gotta, this is where you are, this is the promised land, this is where you cross over. He says, be courageous, <laughs> be strong. And later on he says, be very courageous. <laughs> so, when, when God especially says that to you, or anybody else for that matter, you must think, what on earth do they know? What do they know what's up ahead that they're saying that to me? So Jesus says to them, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you? Let not your heart be troubled. Neither be afraid. You've heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And then he goes on and talks And then towards the end of verse 31, it says, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Now, the next number of verses, up to verse chapter 15 up to verse 8, and onwards from there. He's dealing with a vineyard. I'm, and, and commentators assume this, and I've 
and I would agree with them, not that they need my agreeing, anyhow. But they were possibly walking through a vineyard on their way to their place of prayer where they usually met. And so he starts speaking about that. Does any, um, could someone please just turn to Isaiah chapter 5 and read that to us? Please, if you can, the first seven verses where Israel is compared to a vineyard. I'd just like someone just to read that, if you would. Can I read it out of the Passion Translation? That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Let me sing a song for the one I love, called My Lover and His Vineyard. My beloved planted a vineyard on a very fertile hill. First he dug up its ground and hauled away its stones. Then he could plant within the choices within it the choicest of arms. He built a watchtower in the middle of it and carved a wine press out of its rock. He fully expected it to bear good grapes, but instead it produced only worthless wild grapes. So now, you residents of Jerusalem and people of Judah, you be the judge, judges. What more can I have done for my vineyard? When I expected it to bear luscious grapes, why did it produce only wild, worthless grapes? So let me tell you what I am about to do to my vineyard. I will tear down its fence and it will be plundered. I will break down its walls and it will be destroyed. I will make it a wasteland and no one will cultivate the land. It will grow only weeds and thorns. I will command the clouds and they will not drop their rain upon it. For Israel is this vineyard of Yahweh, the commander of angel armies. And the people of Judah are the garden of his delight. When he waited for a crop of justice, he got a harvest of bloodshed. When he waited to reap fairness, he heard only the cries of the of victims. Thank you. Um, most Israelite or Jewish like men, especially the men, for some reason they didn't teach the woman. Travesty as far as I'm concerned. But um, w- would more than likely be familiar with Isaiah chapter 5, where Israel is compared to a vineyard. God planted it. The Father planted it. Almighty God planted it. What's his expectation of that? That it would bear fruit. It wasn't just, oh, this is lacquer. I think I'll just do a miracle here. I'll plant this here and these people. And I'm not trying to degrade God. Just, yeah, I mean, it wasn't some kind of a casual thing. God, <laughs> God never does anything casually. <laughs> There's always intention with it. Uh, and... Um, so as Jesus walks through here and he starts speaking, and I'm going to read the first eight verses here to you, and I'm going to, we're going to make some comments about it. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, compared to Isaiah 5. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, and it may bear more fruit. You are already clean. Because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me. Some versions say remain in me. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. The vine being the the main stem, the main trunk if you like. Uh, Abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is, and is withered. And they, gather, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are, they, are, they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. He's speaking here, obviously, about bearing fruit, and he's saying, 
He's saying in, in Isaiah 5, Israel was the vine. But I'm the true vine. He compares the two. Uh, so th- they would have, whether they, some, some, of, some of the kids who went on in, in, in rabbinical school could, could quote the whole Old Testament. But, but they would have been familiar with it. It wasn't something that they just, Jesus just plucked out from somewhere. They were familiar with it. He said, I'm the vine. I am the true vine. He said, my father's the one who plants. And my father's the one who brought me forth. So, yeah, after, see, after Jesus' departure, and we know this, they don't know that at that particular stage, the Holy Spirit will be giving in a greater way than ever before. And I mentioned some of that last week. Okay? Remember, in, in this respect... They're still living under the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament um, situation, where the Holy Spirit came upon someone for a time, for a particular event. They didn't come and dwell within them and remain there. The first time that happens is when, is when Jesus is baptised, as a, as a person, as a human being, as a man, he's baptised, the Holy Spirit came on him and remained on him. Hey, somebody out there puts his Jesus. Yes, I understand that, but he came as a human being. You've always, you've always got to remember that. He, take, he took off his royal robe. He took off his godliness, who he was, the creator, the one who spoke words, and things happened. And he came as a human being. And, and some would say, and there, there seems to be some kind of record, I don't want to debate about it, that he didn't do any <coughs> mighty miracles before he was baptised, before he came as the, before his ministry started. We won't argue about that. Some folk uh, have a differ on that. But the thing has really started happening when he was baptised in the Holy Spirit. Okay? That is how he did it. Because later on, and in John um, 14, he says to his disciples, the works I do, you'll do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to the Father. The works that Jesus did on earth, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. Could he have done it without the Holy Spirit? But yes, then he would have taken on his godliness. So he, he's able to say to us, to his disciples, the works I've done, you can do them too. Why? Not because you're greater than me. No one's going to be greater than Jesus. But when I leave, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And you'll do the same works I do, and in greater. There'll be greater volume. And in some time, some places, you probably raised, the people have raised more people than Jesus did. That doesn't make Jesus insignificant. Mm-hmm. It's just that he's given them the power to do that. So, so the Holy Spirit will be given in a greater way than ever before. They couldn't imagine it. They could only, later on, uh, probably about 50 or 60 days after this, no, about 55 days after this, this talk here, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, that they then suddenly realised it's exactly what he's talking about, because suddenly they had power. It's interesting, um, the, the night I was... We all have different manifestations, so let's not... We're not going to compare one person's manifestation and one, another person's um, relationship with God or the Holy Spirit and the way they react to someone else. That's not what I'm trying to say here. But it's just interesting. I come from a, from a holiness background, which believes that, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for sanctification only. And, uh, and that's about it. And so I'm not putting them down, I'm just saying. And, but the night I got baptised in the Holy Spirit, I was kneeling, two Pentecostals came and prayed for me. And, um, and, my, and Carol was a Pentecostal. And, uh, and I, I suddenly started, I started, I thought, I, I opened my mouth to say, ah, and these words came tumbling out. Yeah. I got up from there and I felt like I could push over a wall. I didn't try it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt that, that's, that's how it was manifested in my life. It might be manifested in a different way in your life. So we're not yet to compare. But the power of God comes into you, whether you feel it or not. When you're baptised in the Holy Spirit, that is what happens. Yeah. You still have power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be a witness unto me. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. 
And so he's given it a greater way than has ever been experienced. So the Holy Spirit will make Jesus real. Um, <laughs> We've got to continue, they, disciples, is what he's saying to them, you've got to continue to rely on me. But, but he's going to be gone. So how do they do that? Well, the Holy Spirit. Why? The Holy Spirit is exactly like Jesus. Okay? Another one of the same kind. So I just want to have a look at this because all that has been said here is because of the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. Okay? You can't do some of these things without the Holy Spirit. Well, you can, can't do most things without the Holy Spirit, actually. So Jesus here says, uh, let, let me just reiterate this here. The Christian draws energy from Jesus as a branch draws life from a tree. Okay? In this case, it's a vine tree. So don't think about bark and all the rest. Just think about a very strong vine. Okay. Um, with many branches, and he's the true vine. Israel was a vine, but it wasn't the true vine. Okay. And the branches stay alive because of contact with the main trunk. Uh, you know, it sounds obvious, but just think about that. Because which, that main trunk is what provides sap and energy to that branch or to those branches. Uh, do you know of anything that can give you energy? I'm not talking about Jesus or the Christian context, but many people chase things. I say, ah, oh, I'll get energy out of that. Uh, <laughs> what did you say? Baraka. I'm with you. <laughs> well, what's, a, what's that red bull gives me wings? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I tried that. I felt like the bull. Did you feel like you're fighting? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I can have those things. But all those things, if they do give you a bit of energy, it's only for that moment. Yeah. And sometimes, and after that, you've, you've been let down. Yeah. It's like guys who drink a lot. And, oh, they have what they call, they call it Dutch courage. Or they get, when I've, when I've got, I've had brandy in me, I'll, I'll fight anybody, you know. Yeah. But afterwards, what do they feel like, you know? Well, Someone used to say, says, you have champagne in the, in the in the evening, and real pain in the morning. <laughs> so, so there, are, there are lots of things that will give you energy, but it, it will let you down after. Drugs can do that sort of thing. You can suddenly be enlightened and see flashy things and spooks and all kinds of things. But, uh, so we, get, we can get energy, from, temporary energy from other things, but that, it's not the true vine. The true vine and the energy comes from Jesus. Um, and, his, and we draw our life from him. The vine tree is many broad branches, stay alive because of contact with the main trunk, which provides sap and energy. Um, as I said, other agencies claim to give us energy and life. It's only Jesus who is the true source of life. Okay. We're going to look at certain things in here. I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment now. To you, I was going to make it a bit later on in here. Carol and I lived in Australia, in Western Australia, for three years. Um, it was part of a church planting thing in Western Australia. We lived in a little town called Augusta, had 900 people in it. And um, there, we were kind of funded from the people who called us to be there and planted a church. And um, there was a that part of Australia is, is wine country. I know uh, South Australia is the same thing, and New South Wales, it's also it's a wine country. But this was quite, quite a new industry. At that stage, it's probably about 40 years old, which as far as the wine industry is concerned, is brand new. Anyhow, so there was a, a dentist who owned a vineyard, and he asked us if we wanted to come and earn some extra money. And we were allowed to do that, and so we worked in his, in his vineyard, okay? Uh, all the way from pruning to uh, the harvesting, and, and don't worry, guys, it was table grapes, okay? And, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> it was red globes. So, so I'm, I'm a bit of an expert about the right size. Uh, and it was for export. 
Now, what, the real point I'm trying to get at here is that uh, after the harvest, it would, be, it would be pruning time. And um, we would go into the, into the, into the vineyard and we would, we would prune off. If, if the branches have become a bit too long, and what happens then is that they don't have as much, they don't, the grapes aren't as, as strong the further away it gets from the vine, uh, from, from, the, from the main source. Okay. Now, I know that doesn't apply to Jesus. Jesus can give us life no matter where we are. But just to use that as an example. And so we would, we would prune it, we would cut off, we were taught how to do that, and you'd cut off. And anything that looked like it was dead, obviously, it wasn't bearing fruit, got cut off immediately. Uh, because you don't want to have that there. It, it draws something, but it detracts from the rest of it. There were also kind of thicker, thicker branches that had to be, because there's wires running along, and that had to be kind of twisted around these wires so that the, the branch doesn't droop like this, but hangs like that. Okay? And those things were old. Some of them were quite thick. And you twist it to get it around the branch. And so these things were trained. These things were nurtured. These things were, weren't quite mollycoddled, but they were, they were made so they can bear fruit. So yeah, it tells us in, in verse, chapter 15 and verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Father God, I think in the, in the, in the, um, the Passion Translation, it calls him the God now, I think. Does it? Have you got the... Oh, sorry, I didn't... Sorry. Okay. Um, he's, the, he's, the, he's the vine dresser. He's the gardener. God is the gardener. Um, the farmer. The farmer it says there. Okay. No, the NIV also says God now. NIV says Father. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Father. <laughs> father, Father, not farmer, Father, Father God, plants the vine, he sends Jesus. So he's in, a, in that respect, he's planting Jesus. Okay. Jesus is the vine. And he watches over it. And he is the one who fulfills his purpose in Jesus and watches over his people. So that's the illustration there. I'm the vine, my father is the, is the vine dresser, my father is the farmer. He's the one that actually, the vineyard belongs to him. I belong to him. I've been planted by him. Okay. And um, watches over his people. His plan is to see that his people are fruitful. Same thing in Isaiah 5. What, no, Israel's the vine. And branches... There's no fruit. All this come is weeds and horrible stuff and sour grapes. Mm, I never thought about that. <laughs> Probably sour grapes. <laughs> and um, so he watches the, the object, object of that, of, that, of this vine, of this vineyard, to bear fruit. Otherwise, it's not just there for. It might look nice. There's nothing more to it. And the dead branches get removed in 15 and verse 2. It says this, um, Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it might bear more fruit. So if it doesn't bear fruit, it's taken away. And if it bears fruit, you still get pruned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do or die. <laughs> like a case 22 situation. No, it's not. He does it so you can be, so you can be more fruitful. So he, and that's what we did with that. We would, would cut it back and anything there that was kind of not wanted, that was a little bump that wasn't going to produce anything, or tiny little thing that looked like it wasn't going to do anything, we cut that off. Anything that prevented it from really becoming really fruitful. So, um, he watches up. Here's the one who fulfills his purpose in Jesus. The dead branches get removed, unfruitful, cut away, to make room for others. And that's what it is. Every branch in me at not bearing fruit refers to people who make claims to, be, to faith, but who do not produce 
the slightest evidence of true faith, eventually cut out of their relationship with Jesus, like Judas. There are people, now don't think, oh, does that mean I'm going to lose my salvation? No, no, it's not talking about that. It talks about people who have come in who are false, who say they are, like, like Judas. And, uh, and Jesus picks him, knowing that he is going to betray him. And so all the things that Jesus said and all the, all the words he spoke, in fact, had no, no effect on Judas. He probably did some righteous thing and kind of behaved himself, but he stole the money. All during that time, he was stealing the money. And makes these remarks about, you know, this woman breaks open this alabaster box and pours it over Jesus. Oh, we could have used that for the poor, you know. No, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was unfaithful and he was going to, he was going to put that money on the horses or whatever. Or whatever he did, you know. <laughs> All right. So it's every branch in me that does not bear fruit refers to people who make claims to faith and do not produce the slightest evidence of true faith. And Judas really did not. He was like, he was there and... But it, it was necessary for him to be there because he, there was the closest. I mean, he's part of the 12. That was an important relationship, that 12. Yeah. And, um, but he's in there, but his purpose, I don't think he even realised it, what his purpose was going to be. Yeah. And when the time came, he said, oh, I need some uh, 30 pieces of silver will just do really well in my bank account. I can buy a Maserati with it, and uh, or whatever, new camel. And um, so, he was unfaithful from the beginning. And uh, I, I've seen this often. You, um, <laughs> I think it's in Titus that talks about about unfaithful people. Either Titus or in, I think it's in Jude. It talks about. People have come in amongst us unawares. And the expression that's, the expression that's used there is like, is like, is like <laughs> going the wrong way up a... Up a uh, obviously, they didn't have one-ways in those days. But it's like, it's like you're, you're in a one-way street, but you want to go this way. So what do you do? You don't turn your car around. You just go backwards up there. So... <laughs> So, I know Jude wasn't referring to that, so just maybe get that picture out of your mind. But it's like people coming in and slipping in unawares, and they're part of it. And they're part of the congregation. They're, but they're never really part of the congregation. They're just there to see what they can get. And sometimes I think with some of those people, I don't think they even realise their motives. They're just unfaithful people. And the word never seems to affect them because they don't take the word in. So, verse, verse 2 says, um, uh, yeah, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And so, God does that. God comes and prunes us for our good. Not, not, for, not so that he can be hurtful to us or mean to us and take away our pleasure or whatever it might be. He comes because that, whatever that is, it might be the way you conduct your thought life. It might be, you know, um, some kind of habit. It might, you might be a secret druggie. Or, I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. And, and those things are, are preventing you. And you might say, well, oh, but, but, maybe down the road. <laughs> those people do it and you don't say anything to them. Yeah, but for you, my, my son, or for you, my daughter, this is what I want from you. So let's prune that thing out. Let's get that thing out, whatever it might be. So never, if I may say this to you, never compare yourself to someone else because it, yeah. God's not into that. God's concerned about you as an individual, loves you as an individual, loves each person as an individual, and he wants to see you grow. And so my deal with something and otherwise, you think, well, they get in the way with it. That's got to be okay. No, no, no. Mm. God says. And so we deal with that. Mm. Always remember, 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. He's, it's new every morning. Then he says in, in verse 3, he says, You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. <laughs> Fruitful branches are cleaned or pruned so as to be more fruitful. And it helps them to produce more fruit. Vines always need pruning. Always. They never, never left. There's never a chance, well obviously if it's a good vine dresser, a good farmer, a good, they'll look for those things. They'll come to each vine after the harvest and have a look. And this needs to be dealt with, this needs to be dealt with. That's what Carol and I did and there were other people doing the same thing. You get these, um, what do you call those, pruning, pruning shares. I had, I had carpal tunnel syndrome, so... <laughs> I was I was removed from that. <laughs> and Carol did the work. <laughs> I thought typical South African. Me flow of air, that's a bunny ice. And funny enough, there were two or three other South Africans around. It's the same thing. <laughs> they wired me out to work and we stayed around. <laughs> we didn't drink beer now, so don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so vines always need pruning and the, and the vine gets trained remember I said to you that it gets, it gets put over that, that wire again so God's care is that you'll be the best fruit you can produce and to do that you need to be pruned you need to be cleaned off in fact that word also means that you need to be cleaned off you need to be trained pruning the young vine um, cutting away a large quantity of previous growth to make room for fresh growth. That's the main work of the vineyard, to produce, obviously, fruit and to make sure it's done. And so Jesus says, he says, you guys are already clean. You've been pruned by the word, by the words, uh, by the word that I've spoken to you. He says so early on, I think it's in John 13, as Robert Yeah, he says again to them, you're already clean, because of the word which I've spoken to you. And so I'm, I've, I've been pruning you all along. Um, to give an example, um, I think of Peter. So I'm always speaking on Peter. So the wonderful thing about Peter is that he was bold enough to get in there and go and do the thing. He got out the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, okay, he did sink. But at least he got out the boat. Yeah. And all the other disciples say, Ha! You silly man. Oh. <laughs> so he, he, Jesus makes a statement about going to his death. And Peter rebukes him and says, Not so. It's not going to happen. And Jesus says to him, Get behind me, Satan. You're, you're standing in my way. And so, what is he doing there? What is, God, what is Jesus doing there? He's taking his word. And he's pruning that thing out. He's cutting that thing out. That, that word that was actually a selfish word because all those disciples, in fact, were selfish. They think, well, this is the Messiah. Hey, we're going to be one of the, some of the top notch here in, in the new kingdom. He's going to be the king. And we're going to be the oaks who are going to be riding there with him. And that wasn't voiced like that. But James and John, their mother, came and wanted that. <laughs> and, and the other guys were cross, but they also thought, oh, why didn't my mother get in here quicker and ask for that? So he comes with this word, and, and it's constantly, you see him speaking to his disciples, uh, rebuking them, leading them, directing them. And it's all of his word. He's busy pruning them, cutting this, because they're young vines, and they need to be helped. And so all of this takes place because... It takes place with the Holy, because Jesus is there. And afterwards, when he leaves and the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit does exactly what Jesus did. There's another one. Only now, he's everywhere. He can be, is everywhere. And he's in many people. Okay. So he's cleansing, continually cleansing. Um, the starting point of spiritual fruitfulness is receiving God's word. 
It says here, you're already clean because of the words which I've spoken to you. Our fruitfulness, yes, because of the Holy Spirit. But it starts off with the word that's spoken. It cleans and it, and it comes embedded inside of us and causes fruitfulness. That's the starting point. <coughs> Maturity comes into our lives so we, as we continue to receive God's word. John 15 and verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. That, let me tell you, is only possible by the Holy Spirit. We can't... <laughs> we can't uh, have any of that without any of us abiding. It's the Holy Spirit that causes us to abide. How do I abide in Jesus? No, he's not here. I mean, the physical Jesus is not here. So how can I and how can then you or any of you all at the same time abide in Jesus? No, you can't. But who comes and does it? The Holy Spirit comes. Start off with the Word and the Holy Spirit comes and get baptised the Holy Spirit. We get filled with the Holy Spirit and causes us to remain, to abide. I think some of the versions might say, instead of abide, it might say remain. But either way, that's what it is. Abide means to live in, stay there. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. We cannot bear fruit. We might be nice people. We might be good people. might be all... But it'll... Pre- it doesn't produce fruit that lasts. Mm. It's, a, it's a temporary thing. Maybe a bit of charity here and a bit of charity there. I'm not putting any of that down. Mm. But fruit that lasts, spiritual fruit. If you look at Galatians 5, and verses 22 and 23, I think, you can correct me on that, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Where does that come from? Just because we're, we're nice people. Uh, it comes from the Holy Spirit. Just there. Interesting thing about that, there's none of them. <laughs> yes, there's none. Um, is the first one is love. And actually, every one of the other eight come out of that, if you like. Because if love is the central thing, then there'll be long-suffering, patience, and all goodness. All those things come out of that. So we could say there's one main fruit of the Spirit, but we, I'm not going to try to contradict the Scriptures. It's nine of them. Connected to one Corinthians. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and maturity comes into our lives as we continue to receive God's word. Remaining in or abiding in um, is persisting in what happens at our conversion. When you're born again, there's, there's, a, there's a life force. There's things that take place there. God forgives you of your sin. And at conversion, it takes faith to get converted. Where does the faith come from? Well, it tells us in, in Ephesians 2, and verses 8 and 9. It says, By grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. The grace is a gift of God. The faith is a gift of God. With it, beforehand, you didn't have faith. Where does it come from? It comes from God. So he, he says here, he says, it's what happens with, sorry, let me just rephrase it. Abiding is but dependent on, persisting on things like faith, yieldedness. When, you're, when you are born again, you're, you've yielded to God. You've yielded to the word. Okay? You might think, well, I don't remember doing all that. But, but your act of receiving Jesus, of saying, I believe, come into my life, shows a yieldedness. Okay? In receiving um, it's faith, yieldedness in receiving what God says to us. So we persist in that. When God speaks to us, we obey that or listen to that or assimilate that thing into our lives. We're persistent in doing these things so that it doesn't fall by the wayside. Um, oops, my eight minutes is finished. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <It's a> <laughs>
அவளை போல ஓடி வாய்ஸ் பண்ண சார் this way as we yield to him and maturity comes to that maturity continues uh, comes to us as we continue in the word as we assimilate the word and read the word so it's not just i'm a great believer in um i like to read the bulk of the word i've got a, some programs of program that mom i'm doing where i read the word in six i should say six minutes <laughs> in six months and it's it basically it's a bulk thing and there's nothing wrong with that but i also believe that you need to have a, a verse that you meditate on someone re- likened that a long time ago i was saying to meat and potatoes now no don't think about diets now just just think about food no need to meat and potatoes the potatoes is the bulk of the word you need that I believe it's important. What's I going to do in six months? Um, and there's not much time really to meditate on, on something if you're doing it in six months or in three months. A friend of mine used to read the Word. Um, he used it, he'd read it ten times a year, go through the Word of God. Okay. So there's no time to meditate on it. But it's important we have, the, we have a bulk thing coming through. And... And at the same time also, that there's a, a particular verse, a particular phrase, and we meditate on that, think on that, because we need them both. We need to have a wide idea of the word, we need to have specific things in us. And that's how maturity comes. And maturity comes through, obviously, obedience, but it starts off with the word of God. And who is the word of God? Jesus is the word of God. Okay. This way we experience God's power, Jesus' power, day by day contact with the living Lord Jesus is necessary for God, godliness and fruitfulness of every kind. How are you in contact with Jesus every day? Through prayer, through the word of God, through hearing his word. And as we persist in that, walk in that, day by day, um, sometimes moment by moment, but day by day, So I would encourage you, um, 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 Carol prefers to um, do her meditating and reading at night. So we have a thing in our household. I do the morning while she does the night. Time. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just, we're all different. Yeah. So don't try, I know Jesus got up early in the morning. I know Jesus also spent all night in prayer. So if you want to use that as an example, well then we better do that as well. But what I'm saying is, It's a persistent day by day, night by night, or morning by morning, or morning and night, it doesn't matter. Just being with him, consistently, what does his word say? Maturity doesn't happen overnight. Fruitfulness can start, but it's, it's the persistence of that. And allowing God to come along and prune us, and cut off those things that are not for us, And, and the unfaithful ones who don't bear fruit at all, don't give a hoot about carrying it, they are removed. So don't think that's, that affects your salvation, your relationship with God. And you might say, well, I don't bear as much fruit as that person over there. Don't compare yourself. Let God do the comparison. God will say to you, you need to produce more fruit, and this is how you're going to do it, whatever it is. And she'll give us his word. And then it says, if anyone does not invite him, he is cast out as a branch. And that's verse 6. And is withered, and they gather and throw them into the fire. If you abide in me, verse 7, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Mm-hmm. Disciples bear fruit. Mm-hmm. And the fruit is godliness. Right, so was it? Isn't that winning people to Christ? That's part of it. It can be. When we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That's a Christ-likeness. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you the, the interesting thing about that. Um, if you want to stand on the, on the street corner and give out tracts, that's fine. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, in no way am I saying any of these things are wrong. But for me, the main thing... And you can do that. The main thing... Is to, sh- is to show forth godliness. A 
And how was that done? It started to spread living within us. And come out. The Bible says to us, says to us that uh, in Corinthians, it says that you, uh, Paul writes, it says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So who's living inside of you? Holy Spirit. Who's looking through these eyes? Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And the Holy Spirit, what does he do? He reveals Jesus. Jonathan, Marithan asked me a question last week about people who stuck things to the wall, spoons or whatever. I don't know if you ever came across a guy called Yuri Geller who could bend his spoons and all the rest of it. Now, I'm not saying he was a Christian, but you'll, you'll find Christians doing all kinds of weird things and say, oh, Jesus. Yeah. No, if they're revealing Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. If they're not revealing Jesus, well, I won't make any comment about that. But it's... He always reveals Jesus. He loves to reveal Jesus. And as he reveals Jesus, what does that say about Jesus? Jesus does whatever the Father says to him. So we see Jesus, we see the Father. And there's this... I believe there's a glow upon each of you. Really do. Now you might not... I might have, I might have to wear dark glasses when I look at you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's a glow. I say to most brides... Um, it's amazing that a person can be a, tra- a woman can be attractive, uh, but on her wedding day, there's there's something about she gets transformed, mm-hmm. whether she loves Jesus or not. There's something that happens. There's a kind of a glow about them, mm-hmm. and um, and there's a glow about each one of you. Who are you? You're the bride of Christ. And I said to you, I'm I'm a male bride. M A L E. What am I? I am. Not a male order. <laughs> Before you get ideas about this. But, um, but we're all the bride of Christ. Yeah. And, we, and we show a bit. And don't be like, try, don't compare yourself to anybody else. You compare yourself to what Jesus is showing you. He'll reveal himself to you. And that's what you're looking at. But thank you very much. Yes. One thing that stood out for me is, you know, comparing the Isaiah to John. Mm-hmm. When you read about the vineyard in Isaiah, it's almost like a complete story. You know, it's like no. it's like leaves you hanging. Yeah. And then to the, <coughs> wait all those centuries for Jesus to come, and then fulfill and complete the whole story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like. Actually, the Bible's full of that. Yeah. I, I, I didn't say stuff. I don't mean stuff in the wrong sense. The Bible's full of this, you know. Amazing. This thing happens and it eventually, oh, that's Jesus. Yeah. It's like Joseph. Because you know. Jesus is the Redeemer. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing story. that he leaves undone. That's, that's right. And, and every story in the Bible, in the Old Testament, points, well, no, everyone points to Jesus. The Redeemer is coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. That's great. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Yeah. We just we were just bask in it. We just we were just lie with our on our backs and just let you shine on us and we love shining on us. We just we love you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for each person here. Thank you. Thank you. We pray that you'll just we ask that you just manifest yourself through each person here. Thank you for the different personalities. Thank you for the different ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. And yet you've caused us to be one. Yes. And, you, and you are central to everything we do. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your revelation of Jesus.